This is the second lecture of the Radar Systems Engineering course, and it's a review of electromagnetism. Uh, there are a number of students who are taking the course and who wish to take the course who have not had a third year undergraduate course or better in electromagnetism. Uh, many of them are, say, uh, electrical and computer engineering majors who are gone down the computer engineering track, CS majors, math majors, mechanical engineers. Uh, this is a, a very brief, um, the order of magnitude of an hour, uh, review uh, of the electromagnetism that you'll need to understand reasonably well to take this course. The electromagnetism that you'll need is really focused in a number of, of, of the sections of different lectures. Uh, you, you still get if you if you, you but you really need a good background in electromagnetism. So we're going to move on with that, and you should, should take a a formal course or a course on the web or something like that if you haven't been exposed to an advanced uh, uh, undergraduate or a graduate course. Of course, that would be best in electromagnetism. First, I'm going to uh, introduce the subject by very quickly going over. Uh, the five different key laws and, 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 and that all highlight in coming together as Maxwell's equations and then study and we're not going to study electrostatics and magnetostatics uh, we're going to study uh, time varying electromagnetic waves because that's what microwaves are and I'm going to focus on the points in elect time varying electromagnetism that are important and that will be bearing on as we study particularly the antenna lectures and the radar cross-section lectures. Now we move on to the first of the laws, Coulomb's law, which states that if two ch electric charges, Q1 and Q2, are separated by a distance r, then they experience a force, and that force is given by uh, the, the, first, the magnitude of the first charge, the second charge, the force, which is a vector, is along the direction between the two charges divided by epsilon zero which is the permittivity of free space 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12 and these units and uh, divided by r squared and note that the two charges if they're of opposite sign they attract and two charges of the same sign repel each other uh, the magnitude of the electric force is proportional to the magnitude of the two charges and inversely proportional to the distance between the two charges. And the force is along the line between the two charges. And here is a photograph of Charles Coulomb, and you can see about when he was did his work. Now, the concept of electric field, and here's where I had my mistake. I had an R here, not an R squared. Uh, the, the electric field is really, in physical terms, it's the force per unit charge. So if I want to know the electric field, the distance r away from a, Q, uh, a charge q1, it's just the force divided by uh, a unit charge at point p. And this is that equation. It's a vector, which means it has direction and, and, a, and a scalar quantity. And so we have a, a, a little equation here, force is the, the, the charge times the electric field. And here's that equation we had on the previous view graph. And then you want to understand linear sup superposition that, um, that vectors have. It's this property in Maxwell's equations, not in Maxwell's equations, but of, the, of all the, the vectors, is that the total electric field at a point in space is the sum of the uh, electric fields of each of the different point charges, if we were dealing with point charges. And here we have the uh, electric field of a point charge. The vectors come in towards the point the charge. And if they're uh, positive, they go outward. So if you had an, another charge, Q, out here or here, it would be a uh, Excuse me, if you had a charge here, it would be a repulsive force. 
Now I'd like to define the electric flux density. And that's equal to that the, the permittivity of uh, the medium, in this case we're talking free space, times the electric field. And from that, Gauss, here's a picture of him, uh, found out and measured that this um, electric field density integrated over a closed surface is equal to the charge that's enclosed. And that charge you can find out could be a, uh, a volume distribution integrated over a volume. Okay, so the volume charge density here is rho. And if you integrate the electric flux density over a closed surface, it'll give you the charge that's enclosed in the surface. And it could be a collection of charges or what have you. Cast uh, using vector calculus, which I said we're going to need because uh, I'll be going back and forth. Uh, Gauss's law may be cast in its differential form, uh, the divergence of the uh, electric flux density is the charge density. And if you're curious about do I know enough to carry on, say go, f go from here to here using these two equations, using vector calculus, and see if you can handle that. For the magnetic field, Bios Savar um, developed this law, which uh, describes the magnetic field that's generated by a steady current. And that's the differential magnetic field is the current divided by 4 pi times um, a, the steady current that f f flows through a differential length crossed pro into a unit vector along the line of the current element located to the measurement position that you're measuring the, electric, the magnetic field density and divided by the distance between uh, the DL and the measurement point R. And for an ensemble of current elements, you just integrate this up. And uh, here's the formula for the, uh, um, for the magnetic field intensity. Now, um, with regard to magnetic field, and uh, this, this, could, this statement could be, say, it's Gauss's law for magnetism. If it states it that there, there are no magnetic charges. That is to say, if you integrate over a closed surface, the magnetic flux de density, what you'll get is zero. And that implies that the, in uh, differential form, the divergence of the magnetic field is zero. That says there are no magnetic charges. And um, the, if you, if you could find the magnetic monopole, which this would mean if there were elect magnetic, magnetic charges, if you could find a magnetic monopole, then you get a Nobel Prize. There are dipoles. The Earth is a dipole. You can put charge on a magnet. There'll be a, a, um, one side north, the other side south. You integrate over the closed surface, and you'll get a dipole. You won't get a monopole. Uh, the magnetic field lines always or clo form closed continuous paths. Otherwise, they'd be magnetic sources and they'd exist. And now on to Ampere's law for constant currents. Uh, if a closed contour is bounded by a surface, then the, the, the uh, path integral over that closed contour of the magnetic field, the line integral, is equal to the surface integral over that surface. And that's the, uh, the, the surface current density. And that's equal to the current. And its differential equivalent is that the curl of the magnetic field is equal to the current density. And the directions of um, the sign rule between I and H is they obey the right-hand rule. The line integral of H around a closed path C is just uh, equals the, the current moving through that surface bounded by the closed path. Now, Faraday's law says that uh, a changing the magnetic field induces an electric field. And it's stated in integral form in, in this equation and in differential form in this equation. So if you have a, a magnetic field that changes in time, you'll get an electric field. 
and induced electric fields are determined by d minus dB dt and magnetic fields are determined by magnetostatic are determined by mu zero in a vacuum times the current density. Okay, now on to Maxwell's equations. If we take those first four equations and put down the relationships, I don't have mu zero or epsilon zero because uh, epsilon is the the permittivity of the medium and mu is the permeability of the medium that you're talking about. Surprise, these formulas are inconsistent. If we go through the first, uh, the inconsistency comes about from a well-known property of vectors that the divergence of the curl of the vector is equal to zero. And that you can prove if you've done, taken a course in vector calculus so you can work out the details yourself. If you apply this to Faraday's law, the left side is zero because of the uh, above properties. And the right hand side is zero because the divergence of the magnetic field is zero. But if you do the same operation on Ampere's law, we have trouble. The left side is zero, but the right side is not generally zero. If one applies Gauss's law and the continuity equation, this is the continuity equation, you get this formula. If you apply Gauss's law and the continuity equation, you get the, the divergence of the current density plus the rate of change of the charge is zero, which means that the current density flowing out of a volume is equal to the rate of change of the charge density leaving it. And what that added in here says is that there's an extra current. See, this is epsilon zero dE dt is really dD dt. And so that Maxwell's equations become consistent if we rewrite uh, that the curl of the magnetic field intensity is the current plus the rate of change of the, uh, dis of the uh, electric field uh, flux density. So a changing electric field induces a magnetic field and vice versa. And this is the part, now if, if we add this dd dt term to Maxwell's equations, we get this form. See, here's that extra, and this is called the displacement current. And Maxwell realized that you had to do this um, to have consistency in the equations. And here are Maxwell's equations in integral form and differential form. And for a plane wave solution with no sources, vacuum, and here we see a plane wave uh, transmitting out a field, magnetic field in red. The distance between the peaks is the wavelength. And so we have here uh, a magnetic field along the x direction and the electric field in the y direction. And if we, and if we run the, uh, if we cross E into H, we get the, direct, the direction of the, mag, of the electromagnetic wave that moves out. Okay, now on to boundary conditions. If we use the um, Gauss's law and we set up a um, two mediums that are in a plane, one above and one below the plane, and we set up a little pillbox that extends through the plane, and n is the normal vector to the plane, and above, we'll say, is the uh, uh, medium 1 and below is medium 2 with different uh, dielectric constants they could be. Uh, then it follows from Gauss's law that the dot product of the normal vector into the difference of the displacement vectors is the charge density on the surface. And from uh, uh, the, cont uh, the fact that we have no dipoles, we have a similar expression for the uh, normal components of the, the uh, flux density in the magnetic regime and in the electric regime. So in scalar form, these reduce to uh, the normal component in, in, um, in one medium minus the normal component of 
the extensity in the other in the other medium is just the surface charge on these. Now we know that in a electromagnetic wave impinging uh, on a conductor, um, there's going to be no the, uh, the, these fields won't penetrate the conductor, and that means that a charge density if this electric field is changing with time, you'll have a surface charge density that varies with time on the conductor. And that means that there will be a reflection uh, of an electric field in, by the induced current, a changing current here, there will be an induced electromagnetic wave. And now we continue with the boundary equations. Uh, before we looked at the normal components of the electric and magnetic field, and now we're going to use uh, other of Maxwell's equations, Ampere's law, and then Faraday's law to derive uh, boundary conditions for the tangential components of the magnetic field intensity and the electric field intensity. Uh, the surface we're going to use is, again, a flat surface with a rectangular perpendicular to the surface and on one side and it extends down below to the bottom side in medium 2, medium 1 above the plane. And here we see noted the tangential component of the magnetic field. Now in the limit when the sides of the uh, rectangle approach zero Ampere's law reduces to this equation. What we're doing is we're performing a line integral around this path to find out what the current density is on the surface. And as the sides get small, um, we just have the tangential component here and here. The difference of those two components, if you cross the normal to the surface into the vectors themselves, you'll get the tangential component. And we do the same with Faraday's law. For a perfect conductor, uh, these equations reduce to the, these and these, which basically say that at the surface of a, a perfect conductor, uh, if the electric field is changing and the ma and magnetic field is changing, we'll have uh, changes in the chart in the current density and in the surface charge uh, per unit area changing. And the scalar form of these equations in the uh, for Ampere's law and from Faraday's law are these.